from this slide. Charles Cook, who probably is one of the best political analysts in Washington, recently came up and said, run scared. If there could be more Republicans lose primary elections than general elections. We begin to see it happen when Kama Jean Schmidt from Ohio lost a seat. There are nearly every incumbent is being challenged. And what, is, what has, this has caused is that people who are incumbent, I mean, who are have incumbents and have been there for a number of years, are really looking over their shoulders and are expecting, a lot of them expecting, and are getting primary challenges from the right. And uh, given that, they're going to be paying a little more attention to that and consequently voting more in that direction. And I tell all of our clients, just because we have incumbent members of Congress who have supported our policies or ag policies in the past, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to this year because uh, so many areas of the country that are strongly conservative that are getting, that these members are getting challenges from the right are going to try to weigh, is this ag policy vote a good vote or, you know, are my ultra conservative constituents out there going to want me to vote against everything? So it does have an impact and it does have a bearing. And this statement may be very true. A lot of members have primary opponents. This is the balance of power today. The red is Republican, the blue is Democratic. The changes that have occurred over the past few election cycles that have gone from Republican to Democratic, back to Republican, back to Democratic, whatever, are in rural America. They're in the heart of the rural areas. And these are not city folks. I mean, you look at that and you can sort of see where the, uh, see where Democratic members are coming from, you know, the San Francisco, New York, heavily liberal areas. Uh, but you look at that map and it looks pretty, pretty red, and that thing can change, however, pretty quickly. Now, not to be partisan, this is the problem that the Democratic members have. You've got, after the election, after Obama's election, you sort of had the stars aligned for the first time in many years when you had a Democratic president, you had a, you had a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. And the, there was a, what I call a sort of a pent up demand. I think this particularly was true from organized labor leaders and the environmental community. All of a sudden, all of these things that they'd wanted to see imposed on people for all of these years, you know, they had a, they had a, a moment in time to try to get this done and there was this headlong rush into there. What you got is you got this side of the donkey over here that's the liberal, really liberal folks that have said, okay, let's just keep going left. You know, now's our chance. Now, you've got over here, you got the side that's sort of the more moderate side of the Democratic Party. Used to in the House, they call them blue dogs. There's not, you know, enough to make a pack anymore. Most of the conservative members of the Democratic Party in the House are gone. They were replaced by some of these Republican members uh, that fills a number of these seats in. 2010. So you've got this. Now what this creates is a little bit of an issue and a little bit of a problem. And you're going to see this more and more as we go. You have more than twice as many Democratic seats in the Senate. You know, a third of the Senate is up every two years. So theoretically 33 members. And then one year, 34. Uh, the whole Senate's not up, and the way the cycle has worked this time, you've got more than twice as many Democratic senators up for election than you have Republican senators. And those, a lot of those are coming from states that you don't consider real liberal. North Dakota, Nebraska, uh, Montana, Missouri, uh, those are, Florida, those are not liberal states, and so the more the donkeys go this way, the more that you're going to see these Democratic senators run away from the administration and the administration's policies. Consequently, if this is good news or bad news for you, but consequently it also probably means that Democratic senators are not going to support much of the Obama, Obama agenda in the U.S. Senate. Basically, we're stalemate. Basically, there's nothing much going to happen between now and the election cycle, which may be good news. Now, what are we going to do on ag policy? Are we going to gamble? Is it going to be a toss of the dice? We're in a good location to talk about gambling. Or is it going to be a strategic approach?
approach to trying to deal and to come up with a good farm bill. And that is sort of the question of where we are today. I am a fiscal conservative. I had one of the most fiscally conservative voting records in Congress for 20 years. I don't like government spending a lot of money. I used to get pretty perturbed with people who would come to town and say, oh, we've got to cut government spending. There's too much government spending. By the way, how's our project coming along for funding? You know, it's kind of speaking out of both sides of your mouth. There is not another agency in government that has spent less money based upon what was projected than agriculture. We've done our part. We've taken our share. This was the two, this was a Freedom to Farm, 1996 Farm Bill. I did not like that Farm Bill from the beginning. That is the actual, those are actual costs of the Farm Bill during those years. 2002, we came in with the, the uh, Farm Bill that we had for five years. The blue lines are the projected spending by a Congressional Budget Office, the only thing that predict, the only thing that you can be assured of when CBO, Congressional Budget Office, gives an estimate is it's wrong. It's either going to be too high or too low, but it's not going to be right. But they projected the cost here, the actual costs were here. Over that five-year period of that Farm Bill, we were $27 billion less than had been projected to spend on the Farm Bill. It's not necessarily how much money you got to spend, it's how good the policy is. I don't know of another agency of government, again, that has spent below projected lines. Most of them, the cuts you hear about people taking in Washington are simply reductions in the increase. These are real numbers. Went, went in from, here was the current farm bill we're operating under, as you can see, substantially less than projections. Uh, now we're into some sort of unknown jet because all of these numbers have not been have not been run. But the path starting back in 2002 toward a reduced spending in agriculture has been uh, pretty substantial. This is the federal budget. That's the pie. The little yellow slice is the farm bill. The little red slice is actual Title I commodity programs. The yellow is food stamps. 72% of the cost of the farm bill when it comes to the floor of the House or the Senate, 72% is food stamps and nutrition. The, the red slice, the little bitty red piece of pie, less than one quarter of 1% is what goes to actual farm programs to make them work. So it's not like we haven't made a contribution. In fact, probably the, the one part of the farm programs that today is getting unanimous support from Democrats, Republicans, and every commodity group is a significance and the importance of crop insurance. And that, I think, probably stands a reasonably good chance to be a, uh, a major player in the current farm bill discussions, but it took a $6 billion hit two years ago. And that was on top of all of this up. So, I mean, it's not like agriculture hasn't made a contribution to deficit reduction and to spending reduction. As I mentioned yesterday, what one of the challenges is that people have made up their minds. They have a philosophy for, or basically against agriculture, you know, I don't want to know, just, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. And it's very difficult sometimes to take a bill that, you know, you've worked on for 18 months across the House floor, try to put together very carefully and so that, you know, corn growers in the north and in the south and people from the east to west and all segments have come together in supporting it. You know, if somebody comes on the House floor and wants to offer an amendment to dramatically make a change, they think it may be pretty innocuous innocuous and you have five minutes to debate it. You know, that is, that is a, not a great way to try to have to make policy. So one of the things that is vitally important, we probably spent as much time working on the 2002 Farm Bill on building coalitions as we did on anything else. And then you're able to take those to the floor. Again, a good strategy is one of the best devices, I think, to try, to getting, uh, to try and getting good legislation passed. 
we did it against some overwhelming odds, and we had three quarters of the members of the House that supported it. So it was well worth the time. But you do have to deal with this mentality. We were visiting, in fact, Southwest Council group was up two years ago visiting with a member who will go nameless about farm policy. This person said, you know, I've never liked farm programs. Said, His granddad used to raise chickens and uh, farm programs he didn't like them because it made the price of chicken feed high. Well, I sat there for a minute and we went on to some other subjects and I came back and I said, Congressman, I know him very well. Probably my first name, which I won't hear. I said, uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't mean to be disrespectful or argumentative, but I said, you know, basing the vote on whether or not you like farm programs based upon chicken feed cost of your grandfather umpteen jillion years ago is, you know, a little short-sighted. If anything, the farm program probably had kept the price of chicken feed down. Everybody says we want the farm farmers to make their income from the market. I don't know a farmer who doesn't want to make it from the market. But what happens when the market starts up? And to me, it is the best justification for a farm program that can be made. And that is as long as our government will try to interfere with market prices to get market prices down, then they've got to put a floor under it as well. And they do do that. You can triple the price of wheat, and it's going to have a penny's worth of difference in a box of Wheaties. The Wheaties are going to cost more. So when food prices start up, they look back to the producer. But they, the, you know, the producer's share of cotton in this cotton shirt are not much, or cornflakes, or whatever the case may be. But the government begins to try to take actions to, to lower the market price of commodities when they start up. And again, in my opinion, as long as they're going to do that, they've got a responsibility to help do something under, under the floor. Okay, I'm not going to read all this. I always hate PowerPoints. You know, put something on the screen and I read every word to you. I'm not going to do that. I mean, you can read that for yourself. Basically, this is just this is sort of a trend line that we see. The Senate Ag Committee is going to start very quickly, uh, probably between Easter and Memorial Day and looking at writing a farm bill, and they're going to write it with a $23 billion reduction. The 23, when they had this super committee, the committee of 12 sometime back, all, com all of the committees of Congress were supposed to submit to them reductions. The House Ag Committee is the only one that did it. They did it in a bipartisan, bicameral, but I'm not the House Ag Committee, the Ag Committees of both Congresses. Uh, both Senate and House came together and came up with a $23 billion package reduction and the policy of how to achieve that and submitted it to the Super Committee. Um, thought was if we can get that as a part of a Super Committee presentation, it can't be picked apart as it goes through the process. Well, the Super Committee didn't do anything. But the $23 billion is a reduction that the, uh, that the House and Ag Senate Ag Committees came up with. That will be the number that the Senate will write a farm bill to. The House Ag Committee will write it to 33 billion, more than likely. Uh, that is the budget number that passed the House in a few year, a few uh, days ago or yesterday, I guess, in, and it's the President's proposal and it was the proposal by some of these groups that got together and came up with budget numbers. So they'll probably write theirs to about a $33 billion reduction. Now, in what you'll see, the, the next step you're gonna see is the House take the uh, budget committee proposal, which was passed yesterday, they will re what happens is they pass the budget and then they go back and every committee has to make, rec make reductions based upon the budget that was agreed to. The House number is 33 billion. More than likely, they're gonna take all of those out of nutrition. That's where the growth has been. That will cause a huge fight, you know, gnashing of teeth. We all wanna, you know, starve everybody to death. And, so there'll be these really ugly fights and all, and it really won't get anywhere. The budget's already passed. Uh, it, it's dead in the Senate. It doesn't become law. It is not enforceable or anything else, and they'll go through these fights and everything up there for a few days. Now, when it gets to the farm bill, actually, they will, well, that's that's relative to the um, to the House uh, budget. Writing, writing us to this, 
the more than likely where a farm bill is going to be passed is in lame duck session, which will be the session following the next election cycle. In the Senate, they'll mark this up uh, over, they'll start trying to mark up between Easter and Memorial Day. It may, may very well slip until the 4th of July. A lot of controversial things will come out. The committee wants to come out with, I mean, will have to be dealt with. The committee will want to come out with a, uh, Let's see, there's 21 members of the Senate committee. They would love to have a 21-0 vote in favor of a farm bill. They probably won't get two or three senators, so they'd be real happy with 18. And uh, it's very strong bipartisan to submit to the floor of the Senate for consideration. They don't want to come out 10 to 11. And uh, that, that would set up a partisan fight on the floor. A lot of decisions will be made in the Senate of whether or not to take the bill up in the Senate based upon the politics. Not on the policy, but on is it good politics? It would be good politics for us to pass a bill, and that then kind of forces the House to pass a bill. And or is it good politics not to do it and blame it on somebody and we're in the blame game and all that? And so all that will come into play, and they may take it up on the Senate floor, or they may not. If it really doesn't matter in terms of the long range of this, whether they do or not. The House will conclude their hearings in the fairly near future. They'll begin to look at trying to mark up. Um, August is a dead month. They're gone for August, 4th of July. They're gone. They'll break early. And for, you know, they got to do the conventions. They'll try to break for the election. So there's not a lot of time left. And they'll talk about first one thing and then the other. And, and you know, maybe they pass it, maybe they don't. Again, the politics are going to play into this a lot. The, uh, they probably will do an extension. Uh, hopefully it'll just be an extension. I mean, you've got to start doing something because uh, September the program expires, and so you know people planning, people are already planning for next year. South Texas is already planning crops for next year's uh, programs, and they don't know what they're going to be. So they'll probably have to do some sort of an extension, short term, uh, or until a, a new farm bill gets into place uh, at some point in time. Now, this is where we're going to get a farm bill, in my opinion. After the elections, there will be, because as I mentioned, there's not going to be a lot happening in the legislative process over the next several months because of partisanship and all of those kinds of things. However, after the election, lame duck, after November, between November uh, after the election and the end of the year, there's a whole lot of things the Senate is going to have, the Congress is going to have to do. <coughs> that expire, that quit, and that fall apart if they don't do something. The, those of you who follow like, uh, uh, the process very closely, the sequestration was set up when the super committee did not do any work back several months ago. The this was a change in the process that never been ha never happened before. They appointed a super committee of 12 people, six from the Senate, six from the House, equal number of Democrats, Republicans, six Republicans, six Democrats. And they were supposed to come up with a billion two and trillion two in cuts. It didn't happen. So the axe that was sort of holding over their head was is that if you don't do this, we're going to have an automatic sequestration. And sequestration takes a huge hit. You know, all Republicans want to cut spending except defense. And it takes a huge hit in defense. They don't want sequestration to take place. So, consequently, what's going to happen is they're going to come up with a, we're calling it a mini super committee that would in fact turn off sequestration. It means they got to pass enough reductions. Okay, you got the fence here and you got X billions of dollars coming out of the fence. If you leave those in the fence, you got to come up with offsets somewhere else that you are reducing spending. So in order to turn off sequestration for basically, I mean, again, the Defense Department's what's going to drive this. You got to come up with savings in other areas. Back on the previous chart, 
You will recall that I mentioned that when they submitted to the super committee before, it was a $23 billion reduction. That's the savings. They're going to be looking for every way they can to come up with numbers that will save them all total as much as they need to add back into defense to turn off sequestration. I mean, y'all all need to get you one of these if you don't. I mean, you're probably out there ready to just choke these little stress trucks to death. That's probably where it's going to happen. What will happen is they will, after the super committee fell apart, there's been about three attempts, one very serious attempt, to use the savings in agriculture to offset spending, which they had to do, and that was primarily in the uh, unemployment tax issue back several weeks ago, where you just basically take that and make it pay for it. Well. If they take the $23 billion in savings from agriculture, what will happen is there will be a rapid conference between the House and the Senate based upon both bills that they have worked on, the one the Senate's about to start working on, the one the House is going to be working on over the first part of the summer, come together, write a bill that will save $23 billion, establishes the policy, five-year farm bill, attach it to the turnoff mechanism, or sequestration, it'll be a part of a big package. It will not be amendable. <laughs> they can't take it to the floor of either body and have amendments offered all day long, gutting amendments. So in terms of preserving the work you've done, that's a good process by which to do that because it keeps you from having to go through the fights uh, on the floor of the House and the Senate. They will have a single bill it will be a part of the turnoff for sequestration. It will be voted on in a big package, the little $23 billion farm bill that nobody, savings in the farm bill that nobody, a lot of people up there are not gonna like, is not gonna matter because they're saving $400 billion cuts in defense. So it just kind of becomes a little bitty part of a huge avalanche that's moving through. And so in terms of pre preserving the integrity of the farm bill, it's a pretty good way to do it and it will be, in fact, beneficial. That is, assuming they will both come up with a, uh, a conference report that uh, fits in, I think they will. Both committees desperately want to write a bill. Congress Senator, Chair, Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow of Michigan and, and Democrat, Frank Lucas of Oklahoma Republican in the House, Chairman, have been working very well together, and they want to come up with a bill. So. That, folks, is what I think is going to happen. There will have to be, this bill, under the best of circumstances, would not be able to get through and signed in until December. There will have to be some short-term extension in order to, and it'll be based on the current farm bill. While they're working out all of the details and how do they implement this and how do they administer it through the farm service agencies and all of that? That takes a while to do that. So, uh, and if it doesn't become law until December, they just don't have enough time. So there'll be an extension. They'll work on the current bill for another year, and or assuming it's a year extension, probably will be, maybe not, but probably will because, you know, in reality, it's not a year. It's only nine months because September crops, fall planted crops, will start under the new farm bill next year. 2013. So basically, after it passes, they got nine months to come up with the regulations to administer the program before it actually kicks into place. But good news in that is that even though they're operating under a farm bill, which generally most of them like today, they can get by with it, they will know what the new farm bill program is going to look like. The worst thing that can happen from a lender's standpoint, from people buying equipment, from people making long-term plans, is to have no idea what the farm bill is going to be. So that's kind of where uh, where I think this is going to go. And uh, that is the question: to be or not to be. Now you probably all feel like that little guy right there about right now. So with that, I will take my exit. But I'll be happy to go into any more detail if y'all want to, uh, or try to answer any questions that I can about the about the farm bill process. It will be a bill which probably has 
a lot of broad-based support. You all know that, I mean, you got some specialties here. Rice, for example, we represent rice as well. Rice, crop insurance doesn't work for rice, so they have to have some other mechanism. And we got, you know, you've got a plan the National Corn Growers have laid out there that a lot of state corn growers associations, we represent Minnesota, as I mentioned, and Texas, uh, they don't like it. You've got Stacks program, which is put out by the National Cotton Council. Every, produ every producer in the United States doesn't like Stacks, every cotton producer. They want something there that works better for them based upon where they are regionally. And so an effort will be made to try to get a, a number of these. There may be an alternative program, a revenue type of a program they can participate in or whatever. They will try the best they can to balance a bill to try to get as broad a base of support uh, to the uh, bill when it finally does come forward that they can possibly try to get, which is good news because that means they want to try to accommodate the part of the concerns that a lot of producers have. What might look different, uh, there will be no direct payments. Uh, direct payments are gone. So that is a major difference. And probably one of the most major differences. Um, and those are important. They are particularly extremely important to lenders because I knew they could count on that. Uh, there will be other types of approaches made relative to some kind of a revenue program, whether it be administered through USDA or whether it may be administered through uh, crop insurance, something of that sort. Uh, but that will be the major change. I think if you talk to most people in production agriculture today, uh, they will tell you that that is a huge uh, undertaking when they do away with that. But it's hard for some people to justify direct that's gone. Is there yes, a case for moving the food stamps program out of the Act Committee? Um, yes, there is a legitimate case. Well, will it happen? No. And the reason is, is that when you take that bill to the floor, you go to the people whose number one issue, I don't mean this racially or anything else, but for example, Black Caucus. Black Caucus is not going to vote for a farm bill. It's got nutrition in it. They were some of the greatest advocates we had when we took the farm bill across the floor. So you, the, the reason that it is in there, albeit cost a lot of money, is because that's what makes it politically viable to pass the farm bill. And, and that wouldn't work in any other committee? Oh, it would work in any other committee, but then you've got a naked farm bill trying to get across the floor by itself, and you just that would just kill you. The only reason to get, the only reason a farm bill passes is of nutrition being attached to it. I mean, you know, it's just... You don't think it can stand on its own merit? Nope. I, no, I don't think so. I can guarantee you it won't stand on its own merit. I can, you can take that to the bank. <laughs> if there was any way that would have happened. I mean, you know, and every year nutrition goes up. And every time they reach in and take it out of the farm program, boy, I, there, there is nobody who would rather have that out of there than me, but realistically and strategically, uh, it, it, you know, it's game, set, and match if that happens. Yes, sir. Um, how big of a problem do you see on the dairy part of the, the farm bill? I mean, I, there's a lot of conflict there going back and forth. Is that going to get straightened out, changed, or? Question of how much you know, the conflict and how much the problem will be on dairy policy. Dairy, dairy is one of those really unique industries. There is, you know, dairy policy never, nobody ever likes. What they finally end up with is that, you know, something that everybody can live with. And they are moving toward that. They had pretty much worked out, I won't say that they agreed with the policy, all of the policy decisions, but they had pretty much worked out an agreement on dairy in the bill that was presented to the, C to the super committee and uh, I think I, I think dairy will be one of the will not be the most controversial part of the farm bill today 
Now again, is it going to make every dairy farmer happy? No. But you know, at the end of the day, they'll probably grow something. And that's what it's worth. And I don't see it being a huge problem. Basically, Colin Peterson, Democrat from Minnesota, who uh, is the ranking member on the House Committee, has sort of been given the task of mediating the dairy provisions, and I think Colin's doing a good job. Anything else? Yes. Oh, no, it wasn't hand. That was a camera. Yes. Yes. Well, this has been the way it has been for years. I mean, this probably wasn't done necessarily originally by design, back to your point. But nutrition programs are administered through USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, they have to have authorization like everything else. Uh, you know, also in the Farm Bill are research programs, uh, conservation programs, uh, there's a dairy title, there's a livestock title. You know, there's nine or 10 titles of the farm bill. Title one is the commodity program title. That's usually the biggest in, within those. Then you've got nutrition that's in there as well. So what was done, they, it was done legislatively in order rather than having to bring each of these, you know, let's just do a farm bill, let's put them all in the same time frame, and let's deal with it once every four or five years. It, probably what drove that more than anything else in the early stages was is you've got to have some kind of plan, you know, and it's better to have a five year, you know, I, I mean, on a good farm bill, I wanted seven on ours, you know, we did it, Senate objected, and so we ended up with five. But the, the longer you can do that, the better plans can be made and business decisions and that sort of thing. Now then, it has evolved to the point that, as I mentioned to this gentleman, the reason that bill passes is because of nutrition. And uh, it, you, you'd get some ag votes for a farm bill, uh, you, no question about it. But there are just not that many. You will have, you will have a, You've got members of the Ag Committee that are on there because they're, they want to uh, protect nutrition. And at the end of the day, it sort of pulls them you know, into the fold. But uh, now, the way it has evolved over, over a number of years, and the fact that when you look at uh, that map right there, the, we get we get a lot of votes for a farm bill from here and from here. Now that doesn't look like much geographically, but that's a lot of people. That's where your majority, you know, that's where they mostly come from. Your liberals and nutrition is a big deal with them. When you get to uh, this part right here, just watch this right here. The, you know, uh, yeah, right here. When, when they start trying to come up with $33 billion in reductions in order to meet the budget, to reconcile the budget that was passed yesterday, when they, 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 they throw those back to the committees to come up, they let them make the policy changes. And I, it looks at this point in time like every, all $33 billion of those are going to come out of the SNAP, which is the nutrition program. You want to you see some fun? Watch the debate on that in Congress. I mean, that's going to get ugly. But it points out the fact that when the Farm Bill comes forward, and it probably will have, you know, some nutrition, it will certainly have some nutrition money, 
and there's only of the 23, the 23 billion dollar cuts is about 15 to Title I uh, to commodity programs, about four to conservation and four to nutrition. They have agreed to the nutrition cut. Under sequestration, there's not a dime cut out of nutrition. And uh, so, you know, that was not a real strong balance anyway. I, I care about people who are hungry, but I don't, you know, want people, I've, I've said for so long, government programs penalize the efficient, they reward the inefficient, and so many of the programs institutionalize poverty. There's nowhere else they can go. You could probably cut $30 billion out of nutrition and not affect one person who actually needs the help. Duplication, people, you know, ripping off the program, whatever. But just the idea of cutting it, all they could get agreement to with the uh, Democratic uh, Senate was four billion in cuts. That won't, you know, I mean, it was still growth. It was still, that's, that's below, that is below the level of growth. So in terms, they're only, cut, only reducing the end. Yeah, but again, I mean, you, you realize, yes, philosophically, what I mean, what I like to bowl my back and say, get you know, out of here, absolutely. But at the end of the day, my job was to deliver a farm bill, and that's what the job is today. And you're not going to do it without nutrition being a part of it. Anything else? Y'all probably want to do something else more fun. Yes, sir. Can you, can you touch for just a minute on some of the government regulation, NLRB type things like that, and the global picture, things that are going to affect the outside the egg line, but other things that you see out there that could be affecting uh, small business people. Yeah, you know, that's been probably one of the areas of the uh, broadest level of, of, of concern expressed by people in business has been the overzealous regulations, whether they're coming from EPA, NLRB, whoever they're coming from. Uh, that is the, you know, wh what's happening is, is that they are implementing the regulations to uh, impose on a lot of things that happened, this can sound political, but I don't mean necessarily for it to be, it's just a matter of fact, that happened the first two years of the Obama administration when they had a Democrat Congress. And they passed the law, and now they're implementing those regulations. You know, they're, they're, folks, this, and it's gonna only get worse until we change the philosophy of government. I mean, there, this is, this is pure, pure philosophical, I am a conservative. I want government to leave me alone. I want them to encourage business. I want them to make things possible for business. I want them to encourage investment by reduce taxes. Invest investment has always created more taxes because it creates jobs and more taxpayers. You got 50% of the people in this country that are not paying one dime in income tax. They are living a lot of them, their income comes from the government. It is a philosophical difference. I want the government to leave me alone. They want the government to solve the problem. It's a pure philosophical difference. And that is the direction we have been going and moving. Uh, it's because that's the way the elections turned out. Now, I'm going to predict to you today that the Republicans will maintain control of the House. Again, you know, they're only about four short in the Senate. You got a whole lot more Democratic senators up, chances of losing than you do Republican members. Uh, I think without question there will be some pickup. I, I, I think the Senate will probably go Republican by maybe one or two. In terms of the legislative process, that doesn't have a great deal of impact because uh, well, no, it has a huge impact, but but it probably doesn't cause things to pass any better because basically the Senate requires 60 votes rather than 51 to pass something. Where it will make the difference is on judicial appointments. You will have Republicans controlling committees and will be chairman of the committees and controlling the process in the Senate. And therefore, a lot of the things that the House has passed that the Senate has you know, sent off to the, the the big legislative, you know, waste hole in the sky will be considered and will be looked at.
and so it does have a it does have a big bearing in terms of getting it through. It probably won't help a great deal because it will require votes from both sides. But I, I think this, it, if the Senate, the, the big number, the big difference in the Senate, and we're you know it's a difference of if Democrats or Republicans controlled by one, uh, is the who are chairman of committees and uh, nominations and, and what legislative issues they will consider and uh, justice appointments, both to the Supreme Court and federal judgeships. But, you know, again, it's, there's a philosophical belief that the left has that government is the best to provide to the people. And it, it's moved certainly further than I would have thought it would have. Uh, the government's doing things now that they don't have any business doing. That's sort of a yes, sir. There has to be, immigration is a huge, big issue. The question was on H2A, it's going to be a worker program. Immigration is a huge issue. Uh, and it's deeply divided among both conservatives and, and uh, Democrats. Um, I don't support any kind of an amnesty program personally or anything of that sort. There has been, uh, there have been, arguments for and use made of H-2A worker program. I think it's been abused. Uh, it has to be, it alone is not going to be considered. It's going to be a part of a big overall immigration reform program bill at some point in time and the direction that it goes. I would much prefer that uh, jobs in this country are held by American citizens and to that extent, I think they, maybe there have been some abuse of that, but by the same token, I have a, feel, I have a concern about the fact that um, wage rates in this country have been so driven so high, whether it's by organized labor or whatever, that sometimes it's hard to compete and you know, it has taken away some of our competitive edge, so some of me is concerned about that as well. But um, I don't... Again, H-2A, B, any of the guest worker programs are not going to be on their own. They'll be all a part of a major immigration reform bill, some or some time. <laughs> I'm done. I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to take, you know, any more questions any of you have. Anybody, anybody got, he, he's got to catch a, uh, uh, the congressman. I've got to eat, yeah, I've got to eat lunch. Now. So, anyway, let, let's. Yes, sir. We have a, a question on uh, Supreme Court decision discussion on Obamacare. My, the general counsel of our business, who was also general counsel for me when I was chairman of the House Ag Committee, has a dear friend who uh, is a is a law is an attorney on the Hill follows the court action quite closely, sat in the court the entire time of the deliberation. They start making predictions. Supreme Court's kind of hard to predict from time to time. This person is a conservative. He would love to see the court overthrow or major portions of it. Uh, I would just have to say, again, I'm not an attorney. I do know one or two attorneys. <laughs> That's about my extent of law. But um, I will say his take on the court, and they try to judge this by the questions that they ask, his take on the court is health care is in trouble. And uh, now whether it's a complete strike down, whether it's a strike down of the mandated provisions, which basically guts it or whatever, you even, there, apparently there were even some pretty tough questions asked by the four liberal members that they anticipated would vote for it. Still may at the end of the day. But it will be interesting to see what they, uh, how the way they write that. And uh, pardon me, I think that decision is coming in June. But he, being a, an opponent of the health care, of the Obama, of Obamacare, uh, feels pretty good today about the, he, 
way the direction he thinks the court is going. By the way, this election, whether it's for House, for Senate, or President, this election is trying to reach 20% of the people. Republicans are going to always vote Republican. They may not vote in as big a number from time to time if they're disgusting. Democrats are going to always vote hard. Democrats are going to always vote Democratic. That makes up about 40% on both sides. Let's say, let's say it's 30% on each side. The people in the center, the 20 or 30% of the people in the middle are who determine elections. People who will vote either way based upon um, the candidate, based upon conditions or things at the time. So, and, you know, if you watch the, you know, the, the game show, the, you know, the Newton Mitt show and the Rick show and all that, you know, it's been kind of depressing and all that. All this probably doesn't make a flip when it gets down to the actual election. They will be trying to reach that number of people. So, you know, the general, the public out there, there are a whole lot of folks, but the electorate is about 20 to 25 percent. That's it. Everybody else can always vote the same way. I don't know if that's such a great idea if they always do that, but that's the way, it's just the way it happens. So they're trying to go after 25 percent of the people, and that's, they'll be trying to do their campaigns the same way, and that's why you'll hear so much discussion about groups, the youth. I saw, in fact, I saw a, uh, a story this morning that the youth vote who went strongly with Obama is pretty, in 2008, pretty, 10, 8, pretty, dilute, they're, they're pretty ticked off with him now. Uh, you know, some of those groups that, a lot of the independents that had gone with him were looking for another home. And I did see, one of the reasons that I'm thinking that the House is probably going to stay I did see an article yesterday, almost, this is the year of redistricting, when state legislatures come up with new district lines for everything, including congressional elections based upon population. Nearly all of the court cases, the Justice Department, of course, has to write off on those, and nearly all of those are settled now. And because of the thousands, literally thousands of Republicans who were elected for the first time in state legislatures in 2010, those districts favor Republicans pretty substantially. And so if, if, if a Republican looks at this, some questionable seats are now no longer questionable. Some Democratic seats that seem to be safe are now in the, in the questionable column. And it was basically the way it was done redistricting. And that's one of the, one of the things that I really, uh, I really look at in, trying, in determining what the future of the House is going to be is that the redistricting process from pretty substantially favored Republicans in the next congressional cycle. But. What else? Well, well, thank you Sure, everybody was was pretty enlightened by a lot of that. The the, the uh, uh, it's a, you know a, a fascinating process that, that that we go through to uh, you know to in, ensure our prosperity, so to speak. The the, the uh, and, and there's a lot of trade offs as 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 Larry mentioned there that that uh, you know the the rural part of our economy is growing. Uh, you know, the numbers of people involved is smaller and smaller. The production is bigger and bigger. But the coalitions that are, that, that are made to get things done for our industry are pretty interesting. The, 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 uh, uh, so anyway, let's, let's, let's give the, the, the Congress one more round. Of applause.